also actually the science of sea level change is something that um, I also know a bit about because I did my master's thesis looking at how the beaches in Hawke's Bay respond to uh, sea level change and have also worked on some of the Antarctic projects that were precursors to the ones that uh, Tim was talking about earlier today. So I do not understand the science of, of it and it was great to hear those presentations this morning. It took me back to a happy time. Uh, not so I'm not so happy now. Happy now. <laughs> um, so probably the first thing I need to talk about is actually what is the Property Council. Um, and the Property Council is a member-led non-for-profit organisation that represents um, commercial property interests. So we have over 700 members around New Zealand. Uh, our national office is based here in Auckland, although we have branches in Auckland, Hamilton, Tauranga, Wellington, Christchurch and Dunedin. I, I myself am actually based in Wellington because my job is actually to talk and work with central government. Um, one thing we are not is we are not coastal residential ratepayers unions. We're not the ones complaining about hazards on limbs and things like that. Um, our members do develop large scale residential uh, properties, but we don't have members who are just single or a couple of, uh, own a couple of houses. Uh, our members see themselves as the infrastructure for business uh, in the sense that it's our it's their buildings, the ones that they develop, that tenant, government, and small and medium enterprises and big, big corporations and retail shops. So without those buildings, they don't have a place to actually do their business from. Um, we have a wide goal of, of creating well-designed, functional, and economically sustainable built environments. So we have a real connection to, into the places that our members develop and where they buy their properties and the functionality of those properties to make sure that it, it works for the tenants and, and the people who visit those properties. And we're looking at frameworks that enhance and don't inhibit productivity-driven economic growth and prosperity. And, and, and by that, we're, we're really trying to make sure that the, the planning frameworks and the governance frameworks that, that run this actually help New Zealand prosper. So why do we actually care about sea level rise? Um, well, many of our members own very long-lived assets. Uh, you don't put up a building that's worth two, three, four million dollars uh, and not want it to be around for a long period of time. Um, but importantly, it goes well beyond our buildings. Um, we really rely on the infrastructure that services those buildings, particularly roads, um, because that's how people get to work. That's how they get to the shopping center. Um, the water and the electricity, they're all really crucial to keeping the businesses going. Uh, and most of our developers really care about the communities in which they invest, work, and live in. They really want to make those functional spaces that people actually want to be. You can't sell something or rent something if people don't want to be there. It just doesn't make economic sense. How do we think sea level rise should be dealt with? Well, the first thing is we don't think there should be any knee-jerk reactions um, to it. Um, the, and the second thing is a sensible cost-effective long-term urban planning. And I realized there was a typo in there that I put cost-effective twice. Um, and it w really was a typo, but it does underline <laughs> the fact that <laughs> any solution actually has to, has to be sustainable for, from a cost and economic point of view as well. Um, the other thing about those statements is they're really packed with all sorts of different value judgments and what they might mean is going to mean different things to different people. So I hope that my next slides can help to illustrate what we see some of those things meaning. Right, what not to do. Um, we heard a little bit earlier about Carpety Coast but also the Christchurch District Plan just basically putting hazards straight onto limbs and you had revolts by the coastal ratepayers in those areas um, that have forced the council to rethink. Um, we're not against what the councillors were doing. Actually, what they were trying to do was really, really sensible. Uh, but they got unhinged by, by the process. And those coastal ratepayers um, used that process uh, against them. So well-meaning action, but unfortunately the process let, let it down. Um, but worse than, than bad process, 
is sort of unworkable or impractical rules. Um, and I want to use an example from a current draft district plan. Um, I'm not going to name and shame the council who's put this out because we still hope that it actually might change some of the provisions in, in that plan. Um, but you might be able to work it out because I think it was mentioned earlier. Um, this is a rule that they've proposed in their district plan. And basically that any sensitive activity buildings, so in this case houses, had to be relocatable so that um, coastal hazards, including sea level rise, as they become more severe, these buildings can be relocated. My initial reaction when our policy director <laughs> mentioned this to me was, great, is the council going to make all of their assets relocatable as well? And I had pictures of roads floating up and moving to a new area. Um, Fortunately for me, I wasn't the one writing the submission because sarcasm doesn't actually go down very well uh, on paper in public submissions. Um, so what, what are exactly our concerns with that? Um, the first is that we recognise that councils actually have to deal with, with natural hazards and sea level change and that they actually have a statutory duty to avoid and, and mitigate those. But often that seems to be done at the detriment of economic growth, private property rights, and actually community prosperity. There are, there are a lot of rules that get placed on there that uh, make building a house like that just completely unsustainable. It's telling people what they really have to do on what actually is a private property right. Um, and we were concerned that the implications of that rule on the economic and social future of, of that district. Um, Bearing in mind there were already thousands of houses there and a couple of hundred businesses and tens of kilometres of, of assets. So would this rule really make that much of a difference to that? Um, what we saw was there was no balance in what was actually proposed. Um, so what did we recommend? Um, we recommended that a much better cost benefit analysis of that rule actually be done. The council did one, they did a section 32, but it didn't really have any quantitative data in it at all that looked at what the real impacts of that rule and the various other rules that they had around were, were going to be on those communities, on the businesses and the houses that, that were there. Um, we also recommended that they uh, develop some sort of climate change policy working group um, to actually discuss the issues and, and the problems um, and we've been engaging um, with Wellington City Council on that. In fact, our submission to this council um, specifically said that uh, we think they should do something very similar to what Wellington City was doing. Um, and we know we've had an impact in that submission because we do get copies of all submissions that reference ours. And um, most of those submissions have supported what we've said uh, in that. So there, there are others in this district who are, who are thinking along similar lines. Um, so if that's what not to do, what is actually quite a sensible approach to sea level rise? And I think probably the, the best way is to actually just quote from the Parliamentary Commissioner from the Environment because uh, in our view she pretty much hit the nail on the head when she released her report last year. Some of the key statements that stood out to us were urgency need not spill over into adaptation planning. In all but a few situations haste is not necessary or desirable. It has become clear that there is some time to develop good policy and planning for sea level rise. Councils need to take some time to develop strategies and make fair decisions that are based on assessments that are both robust and transparent. And robust and transparent were words that particularly stood out to us. Because so many will be affected, whether it be by flooding, erosion, or changes to groundwater, councils must engage with coastal communities in a measured and empathetic way. There are also risks with council planning. Restrictions on development that are premature or overly precautionary will incur significant opportunity costs. Um, there's also a very good um, economics paper by Motu Public Policy Think Tank uh, based out of Wellington that looked at council imposed, um, imposed planning rules. Now, none of the rules that they looked at were related to sea level rise, but they estimated that a variety of planning rules can add between $35,000 and $110,000 to the cost of a single house. 
So it's quite a significant additional cost to, to the consumer of, of that house over time. So what did the PC recommend? Um, well, she recommended that there needed to be better national direction about dealing with sea level change, uh, and, and we agree. We think um, there's talk out of the Ministry for the Environment on a, um, a national policy statement on natural hazards, and we think that's, that's a really good place to start. Uh, that MFE needed to update its guidance manual and actually make it a much more living document um, and set the standards and IPCC and the planning horizons. And I think that will go to the, the question that Lara uh, was asked on um, the planning horizons. Actually, this is an area where the central government can really add quite a lot of value and, and help out local government on that. Um, they recommended um, that government give guidance on process with council engagement with coastal communities. Um, and there we're talking not just the residents, but the commercial landowners and the businesses in those communities as well. Um, and actively engaging those communities before any decisions are made on that. Um, she recommended developing whole coastal plans for sea level rise. And um, it's good to hear the Auckland Council seem to be, have done something quite similar uh, with that. Um, because action in one area is going to impact on other parts of that coast. And actually, you need that holistic view about well, if, if you're going to control development in a particular area, where actually is it going to go? What, what is the council expecting over the long term? Um, there is a really good mechanism in the Local Government Act for doing that under spatial plans. And uh, we're a big fan of spatial plans, giving that kind of direction and, and sense of where councils want to go. Now, it's mostly focused on infrastructure, but we actually think councils could use those a, a lot more to get that sort of guidance. And that's the sort of thing that developers really look for. They want to know what the council thinks about things. Um, and the PC recommended establishing a working group at central government level to look at the fiscal and economic costs of um, sea level rise um, that would require input from a range of interests, local government, coastal residents and landowners, um, the insurance and banking industries and infrastructure providers. <coughs> While the PC recommended that this happen at a national level, we actually think it's quite a sensible thing to happen at a regional and local level as well, um, to really discuss those issues at a local community level. Um, everyone needs to know what the rules and the policies are and that they're robust and that people understand the costs and implications of, of what's being proposed. One of the issues in, in my job is, as um, is, and the golden rule, I suppose, is to make sure that you're actually consistent in what you say. And so when I was doing this presentation and looked back on what we'd said on Sea Level Rise in response to the Parliamentary Commission for the Environment so report, I said, well, is this actually consistent with what we were saying about urban planning as a whole? And I drew from a couple of the submissions that we've given into central government and to local government in New Zealand, because um, they're doing a bit of thinking about um, planning systems. And these were the kind of things that, that stood out for me in the summary of one of those submissions. Formally linking and rationalising plans under the RMA, LGA and LTMA, including through greater use of spatial plans. Explicit and deliberate linking of funding and plans, including innovative funding, um, and looking at a world sort of beyond rates. Greater use of national direction in Section 32 analyses under the RMA and any other new national direction tools that might be developed. A rethink of how collaborative processes work across the entire planning system to better balance national and local government, private sector and community issues, including those issues for future residents and generations. So, yep, those are all the same things we're saying about sea level rise, which I suppose is good for me. I'm not tripping over myself. Um, so I guess in our view, there are some systemic problems here that are not just about sea level rise. They, they actually do. Um, there are issues in the, in the wider planning system that, that need fixing as well. But we do think they are quite fixable. And I um, just want to give an example. I gave an example of things we thought weren't going right. Um, I'll give an example of um, who we think is doing it right. Um, now, I put a question after Wellington City um, because it's still early days, um, and we haven't actually seen 
results out of what they're doing yet, um, so we don't know how, how that's going to go. But they've set up a climate change uh, working group, and um, Tim Grafton mentioned it earlier that he's involved in that and the resilience, and so are we. Um, so both Tim and I sit on that. And they're working a lot on resilience planning. Um, I think Tim also mentioned that, well, one of the earlier speakers mentioned about the 100 resilient cities. And that's taking, in a Wellington context, that was often thought about earthquakes, but it's actually really taking a more holistic view that includes climate change and adaptation and sea level rise and all of the infrastructure and business and how that keeps things going. So Wellington City are on the right track and actually some of the presentations I've heard today show that other councils are, are, sorry, are going down similar tracks as well. So that's all good. Um, and I guess as, as my final slide with the, um, as the takeaways, it's sort of, I've given some examples of rules that we don't like, but what is actually a good way to control development? Um, I think my first point really is try and guide, don't control. Um, it's inevitable if you try very specific rules that you're going to get tripped up on them. They, they, do, they can be quite inefficient. Um, but developers uh, generally, they take good guidance from what council has in their plans and what they think council is, is, is going to do with things. They're not going to develop things that don't have infrastructure to support them um, because they can't afford to do it all themselves and they, they want to know that it's, their spaces are going to be connected in with others. Um, councils can, they've got a lot of assets. They've got roads, they've got infrastructure, they own a lot of property. Um, they can lead by example, by being really clear about what they're doing with their assets and their infrastructure. Uh, and sh showing to rate pros and developers and, and owners what's going to happen there. Um, and probably most importantly, um, the first thing uh, council should do, and it's actually probably the second, third and fourth thing that they should do, is talk <laughs> and talk and, and really engage with communities and do that throughout the process. Bring residents, bring the commercial property sector into the discussions uh, early on and you'll actually get a much better uh, result and answer and they'll be part of the solution because they need that land and that infrastructure uh, that the council provides just as much. If working together you'll actually get probably the outcome that you want. It will take a little bit longer but it is some time that we do have in that. I think over time it's really important that councils do identify those at, at risk. Um, they need to sort of engage in the process and have very robust uh, standards towards that. Uh, generally for commercial property um, it might have an impact but those owners will want to know and um, move their assets around and, and move their investment and development and actually it, it is crucial that those are identified at risk uh, because the, the building, it will affect current building owners, but it's something that future building owners will definitely want to know about. These are long-lived assets, and they want to be able to plan around them accordingly. Um, so yeah, you will get grumbling, but um, it's, it's more about the process that you go about doing that. A lot of our members, when they're asked this question, um, because they do talk about certainty, and actually what they mean is about predictability. Um, the having hard and fast rules might provide some certainty and, and predictability, but it comes with a lot of baggage and a lot of cost and a lot of unintended consequences and can stifle innovative ideas and, and, and uh, solutions. So they much prefer more the policy type approach. What are the issues that I should be considering in doing here, um, rather than specific rules? Um, the Productivity Commission, who are doing a review of urban planning, came and talked to us and asked exactly that question. And every developer said, no, nope, <laughs> we don't want very specific rules. We want broader guidance about what council is thinking about 
things and, and what they intend and their vision and that because they want to fit in with that vision 